Okay, fill in the blank. I love, out loud, it's not a rhetorical question. You love what? Crab cakes. <laughs> All righty. I love? God, coffee, chocolate. You're all talking my language. Crab cakes, God, coffee, and chocolate. Not necessarily in that order, but that works for me too. What else do you love? Guacamole. Guacamole. <laughs> Who said guacamole? Kaylee. I love guacamole too. What else? Mashed potatoes, Mashed potatoes coming from the peanut gallery up here. Mac and cheese. Everybody's hungry. Who did not have breakfast before they came to church this morning, it looks like? But do you really love these things? English is a very, very tricky language because we have one word for a word that in Scripture has many, many words that are translated as love. Um, we're going to talk about different kinds of love this morning, four different kinds. We're going to go with C.S. Lewis, who wrote a book called The Four Loves. He was a Christian um, he was a professor, he was a theologian, he was a man of great faith. And if you want to cry sometime, if you need a good cry, watch Anthony Hopkins playing C.S. Lewis in a movie called The Shadowlands. It's one that makes me cry every single time. I know what's coming and I just sit and bawl like a baby. So if you need a good cry, I'm telling you, check out the movie. It's the story of he and his wife. He married an American woman as a favor to her and she became ill and he fell in love with his wife. Strange things happen in the world. There are different kinds of love. How many of you know what eros is? Eros. Same root as erotic. It's that love that Milt looked at his wife with, that girl back in Kentucky, and he's told me that story before. Linda's looking like, what is she going, where is she going with this, where is she going with this? <laughs> told me you looked at her and what did you think when you saw her, Milt? Thought she was beautiful. You were helpless, weren't you? And she hasn't changed. Oh, man, that's good. Look at him. He's like, yeah, she's, she's looking embarrassed. He's like, yeah, I scored one. Thanks there, Pastor Terry. <laughs> it's, how many of you chose who you fell in love with? You picked somebody out of the phone book or out of the, the chart of boys and girls in the world and said, oh, that one looks good. I think I'll fall in love with him. Trust me, I tried back in the day dating on the basis of common sense. It did not work. I dated the two most, not at the same time, but the two most boring men I've ever met in my life because I just thought, I'm going to pick somebody based on compatibility. They were both pastors. Never get involved with a pastor. Let me tell you that. Now they're crazy. <laughs> okay, so we got arrows. Then there's philia. What kind of love is philia? Philadelphia it means the city of what? Brotherly. Brotherly love. Not like your sibling brother, the one that you, you know, give noogies to and the one that you love sometimes and fight with sometimes. This is the love that you have for your friends. How many of you have somebody who comes to mind if your car breaks down in the middle of the night, you know who you're going to call because they're going to come for you? Not necessarily somebody in your family, but the person that you know of who is your friend you could depend on. Judy's going to call Jerry, and Jerry's going to call Judy, it looks like, back there. They're pointing at each other. Oh, no, we're pointing at Rich. Because he knows how to fix a car when it breaks down, right? All right. A friend, not a Facebook friend. Because how many of you have Facebook friends that you have no idea who they are and you look at the name and say, when did I ever friend you? Not that kind of friend, but the friendship that is based on mutual affection and love and concern and compassion. Then there's another kind of love called storge. You know what storge is? It's a Greek word. It talks about the love of parents and children for each other. How many of you had a baby at some point in your life or were handed your child and you just went, Wow. Wow. Now, postpartum depression aside, some of you have had that, I'm sure. But when you get this perfect little bundle in your arms and you think, how did this happen? And you find yourself crying and sobbing and you didn't know. I've heard this so many times from new parents. I didn't know I could love anything that much. I didn't know I could feel that deeply. Do you choose that love? Do you say, ah, oh, this one looks okay. I love this one. But this sister, I don't know about her. No, you love your children, don't you, with an overwhelming love. And I always say the biggest joy, the first joy, is not the birth of a child, it's the birth of a grandchild. Because we get to the joys and concerns and grandmothers have been waiting their whole lives for the moment. Yes, I have a joy, I have a joy, I have a joy. Either that or they bring their air horn and stand on the pew. And they'll say, I thought my children were something until I saw my grandchild. And you just have no idea how much better this one is than the first batch that came along. 
mostly because you can give that one back, right? You can spoil it, give it candy, get it sugared up, hand it back to its parents, and think, ha, 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 ha. There was one of the churches I served, and I've served a couple of churches for such a long time that I got to baptize people and then later on do their wedding or their confirmation or something like that. And one guy was complaining about his little boy, and I said, this is the child your parents wished on you. I was there when they wished him on you. Because he's just like you and you were a kid. He's like, I was never like that. I said, trust me, you were. Storge. Are any of those loves the kind of love we read about in Jesus today? Jesus saying, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. No, because those loves come naturally to us. Sometimes it's like being hit in the head by a two by four. That's how naturally it comes. When you see the love of your life and you know that this is the person. Maybe it was immediate, maybe it took some time coming. But you knew that that was a person that you were destined to spend the rest of your life with. Unlike Milt, who just knew the minute he saw that sweet girl in Kentucky that that was the one for him. He's given me the nod. Yes, he did. He tells that story so often. That's something to still love your wife like that after all those years, isn't it? A good, that's a good gift. But you had no, no, no control over that. You have no control over your friends either, do you? Because you either strike up a camaraderie with somebody or you don't, Right? I'm sure you've met people before and you just immediately, I love the Muppet movie, the original one, because there's the song in there, and it says, there's not a word yet for old friends who've just met. You know when you meet somebody and it just clicks and you're friends forever. That's not a choice. Neither is Storge, because you don't choose whether to love your children or not. You love them. Sometimes it's hard. Now, Storge... This is what C.S. Lewis said about Storge. He said, Storge is the kind of love that the ugly, the stupid, and even the exasperating can be the object of. Your children are not always ugly, are they? Sometimes they can say ugly things. They're not always stupid, although they can do some stupid things. One of the pastors I worked with had twin sons, and at 12 years old, one was screaming in the bathroom, just screaming his head off, and his parents ran in, he's lying in the shower. The shower curtain has collapsed on him, and the bar is bent like this. They said to him, you were trying to do a chin-up, weren't you? He said, no, it just felt like that. <laughs> he told me that story later. I said, your parents are not as dumb as they look. So remember that, too. And exasperating. Have your children ever exasperated you? Can I get an amen on that? Oh, come on. You know your children are exasperating. <laughs> you know they are. But there's another kind of love that C.S. Lewis talks about that is the Greek word which is the root for the kind of love Jesus is talking about, it's agape. Agape is the love that God has for humankind. It's the love that humankind has for God. And it is the love that we are called to have for one another. Let me read you the words that Jesus said again. What were they? I'm giving you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. Okay. Some people said to me, well, he's talking about the disciples in the church, right? We can love just the people in the church, that would be the people who go to our church. Oh, but we don't do that very well, do we, sometimes? If we're honest, there are grudges that happen. There are old wounds that happen in churches that don't get healed. Churches have split over the color of the carpet. They split over the pews that are put in. The United Methodist Church split once over slavery in 1844, and we're going to split again over our inclusion of LGBTQ people. Breaks my heart to think that we're going to split over one item of doctrine that seems to matter more to people than Jesus' commandment to love one another. If you think Jesus is just talking about in the church, this is John's gospel. John's gospel. John 3.16. I bet you can all recite it forwards, backward, and in your sleep. For God so... For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever shall believe in him shall never perish but have eternal life. People say, ah, yes, those who believe in God, God loves. The general conference had to have a vote the last time they gathered to decide if God loved everyone or not. That's how divided the United Methodist Church has become. We had to vote on whether God loves everyone or not. Seriously, I'm not making that up. People like to memorize 316. I always say, Take 17 with it, for God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. This is John writing. So when John says, Jesus is saying, I'm giving you a new commandment, love one another. We have to put it where he said it too. The 13th chapter of John, why are we reading that? We just saying, halle, halle, halle. 
like I've never sung it before. Thank you, Aranda and Kevin and Lambert for that wonderful rendition that got people on their feet and dance a little bit in this congregation. Because it's Easter, we should still proclaim that Christ is raised from the dead and shout hallelujah every moment of our lives. We need to continue to say hallelujah. But this is John's gospel. The 13th chapter begins with words that give me chills every time I read them as well. How does it begin? Having loved his own who were in the world, Jesus loved them to the end. To the end, another strange translation. It's the same verb that is used when Jesus is hanging on the cross. The last word of Jesus in John's gospel is what? It is what? It is finished. But that's not a good translation of the word either. It is accomplished. It is completed. It is brought to fulfillment. That's the love that we are called to love one another with. And it is an act of will. That's where we fall short with agape. We wait for it to come naturally. If you wait to naturally love Vladimir Putin, you ain't never going to love Vladimir Putin. I tell you that right now because he is not worthy of love in so many ways that we measure the worthiness of people. Does that mean we're not called to love him? The person who lives next door to you who just plucks your last nerve, who lets their dog go into your yard and do this stuff on your lawn that they don't do on their own lawn, that's an irritating thing, isn't it? But or if you wait to love that person naturally, it's not going to happen. Or someone who deals drugs or someone who hurts children, if you wait to love them until it feels natural, it's never going to happen. Does that mean it's not supposed to happen? No, it is an act of will. Look at the call to worship. Not part of the lectionary for today, but I thought it went well. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. That means I might be right about things, but if I don't love, it doesn't matter to God one lick. What does it say about love? Love is what? It's patient. It's kind. It is not jealous. It is not boastful. It's not irritable or rude. People can be irritable and rude and jealous and boastful, can't we? It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing. It rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. What else does it say about love? It does what? It never what? Never ends. Whenever I do a wedding, I ask couples to choose their own scripture. They look at me like, what? Isn't that your job to tell us what to listen to? When I've done that, people sometimes will wrestle with it. They'll come up with great passages. I did a, I did a wedding for a young woman. I'd been her pastor when she was a kid. She was no longer involved in any church and came to me and asked me to do her wedding. She and her husband were both ornithologists. They worked at the National um, Aquarium in Baltimore. They wanted to do a dove release. I said, you know, those birds are going to poop on your head, don't you? And they said, well, we get pooped on every day. It's just part of our job. But they let the doves go right over my head. I did not get hit. <laughs> but they picked the passage from Noah where the dove is sent forth and it comes back with a branch in its mouth and then it doesn't come back again and the rainbow appears. And they picked that because they said God's promises are eternal. I've had many couples pick the wise and foolish builders because they learned that when they were little children that if you're you want to build a solid foundation, you build it on a rock, and the rock is Jesus Christ, and they want their marriage to be built on a rock. I've had people pick the one that says about a cord of three strands cannot be broken. So if you make your marriage vows in the name of God, that you and your spouse are going to be married forever. So, but most people, when they hear about, I've got to pick a passage, they'll, they'll go online and they'll say, Bible, love. And it'll come up, love is patient, love is kind. This is not the prescription for a marriage, although it's good advice for a marriage, because the church that I've told the stories about, the one where they started locking the door so the quote-unquote strangers would stop coming in, ah, that was a tough place to serve. But let me tell you what they did with um, love. Hold on just a second. I'm going to sneeze. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. Hold on. Sorry about that. That's why I don't like cats. <laughs> there was a couple there. Their daughter was getting married. And I went to the house of the parents, and I had never met the husband because he didn't attend church with his wife. And we were talking about their wedding that they were planning. And the mother was looking through a catalog at mother of bride dresses, and she found one. And this is like 30 years ago, so 
Imagine the price now. She picked out a dress with $700 and jokingly said to her husband, can I buy this one? And he looked at her, and she was well over 300 pounds at that point. He said, sure, if you order it in a size 4. He wasn't joking. Then she looked at him and said, when you grow hair. It was not this friendly, gentle barbing back and forth. That was the way they spoke to each other. Not the way you're called to speak to your spouse, is it? Ever. Sometimes we're harder on the people that we love than we are on strangers, but we are called to love as an act of will. And sometimes that will needs to be exercised in a marriage because agape includes all of humanity, all of humankind. Jesus said these words in the 13th chapter of John. What else does he do in the 13th chapter of John? Here's your morning Bible quiz. You know what he does to the disciples in the 13th chapter of John the night before he dies? He washes their feet. He washes their feet on his hands and knees without his robe on. He humbles himself and he washes their feet and says, do likewise. And he feeds them, knowing that they're going to deny him, desert him, and betray him. He feeds them anyway. And he looks at them and says, it's time to do something new, that you love one another. This is the only way that you'll know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now what was it that C.S. Lewis said about loving those who are sometimes stupid and sometimes exasperating, sometimes ugly. There's nothing uglier than saying, I don't even know who he is. But Jesus loved them anyway. And he hung on the cross saying, it is completed. It is accomplished. It is finished. And he gives his spirit to his father But before he left, he gave that same spirit to his disciples and said to them, love one another. We are the embodiment of Christ in the world right now. If we do not love as an act of will, the world will not know love. They will not know Jesus Christ. It's a serious passage, isn't it? We've had a little fun with it this morning. We've had some fun in here. Let me tell you, if you can't have fun in church, where can you have fun? I'm committed to making sure that you have fun when you come into these walls, but that you leave with some Jesus with you when you go. Love one another. Not because it comes easy, but in spite of how hard it is, love one another. Love one another is an act of will. I want you right now to picture the person in your mind that has really hurt you the worst in your life. I bet it was easy to come up with somebody, wasn't it? If you ask God, God will let you love that person. Trust me, I'm going to let you know a little pastoral secret. We don't always love everybody immediately when we meet them. Some people are real tough to love, let me tell you that. I used to do exclusively youth ministry work. Kevin, can I tell a story about you when you were a kid? Yes. His wife says, yes, yes, yes. Who was the lady that lived right, oh gosh, she had longer dark hair. She taught Sunday school lived right next to your, right around the corner from your family. Can't remember her name. Mom, do you know who I'm talking about? She taught Sunday school, and she used to say, because Kevin has two brothers and had two cousins who were girls, and they all lived right there together. And they used to say, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And their Sunday school teacher said, no, you have to say, I love you, but I hate your ways. I will never forget one day, um, they were sitting there. It was either you or Brian and Donna. And she said, now remember what you say. And Donna said, I love you, and slapped one of you right across the face and said, but I hate your ways. <laughs> I think it was Brian. I don't know if it's you. You think it was Brian? Poor Brian. We're called to love as Jesus loved because that's how they're going to know that we are his disciples. Not because we can condemn other people, not because we can use the Bible as a weapon against them, not because we don't like them because of how they look or how they speak or where they come from or the color of their skin or any other nonsensical reason. We're called to love as an act of will in the name of our Savior. We've got to learn how to love. We've got to love hard. I told you I had some trouble loving with kids in the youth group sometimes. We were just plucking my last good nerve. You know what I did? 
I went home and I prayed, God, let me find something to love about this child. Give me something to love about this child. Give me something to love about this child. And then I became a pastor. I was like, God, give me something to love about this trustee. Give me something to love about this treasurer. Give me something to love about this whoever. And you know what God did? God gave me something to love about every single one of them. Every single one, because I didn't give up. We've got to stop giving up on each other, folks. We've got to learn how to love. If we learn how to love this community, we're going to have people in here who look different than us. They're going to talk differently. They're going to act differently, and we're going to love them anyway, and they're going to love us back. We're going to have such an overflowing congregation that we will have to put in new pews and add more services because people in the world need to know that they're loved. They need to know that they're forgiven. They need to know that they have value in somebody's eyes. Let it be yours. Jesus waits till the end of his life to say, I'm giving you something new to do. And it's new this time because he's not going to be with them much longer. What gives him glory, what brings glory to God, is when we love one another because then we are doing what Jesus asks us to do, which is to be his presence and power in the world. You are the only Jesus anybody's going to see. Let him live in you. Let him love through you. To the glory of God and our Savior, amen.